Hey everybody, I'm Michael Ralph, and today we're going to be making some catalase reaction curves. I'm starting in Microsoft Excel here. You can see I've just got a blank page. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that you can see what it is I'm doing, and then I'm going to switch over. I've set up some basics already, so let's imagine that we've already run the lab, and I've got a data set here that I'm going to be working from. I made it bold in italics just so that we can see uh, the difference between the numbers we add and our actual data set. But uh, other than that, it's just a basic. We're doing a concentration curve, so different concentrations of hydrogen peroxide, and then seconds that it takes the uh, saturated disks to sink and then rise again. Uh, the first number that we're probably going to want to graph is the arithmetic mean or the average. So all of our formulas need to start with an equals. And then if you type average, you can see once it shows the one that we're looking for, down here I just hit tab and it will finish out the word for me. And then I will select the data set that I want to take the average of. And hit enter. Voila, we have an average. And then click the bottom corner. So if I do it down here, it won't work when it goes that black right there that black cross then we can click and drag down and it will do the same thing for each subsequent line and now we've got a mean waha next up is we're going to want some sort of indication of the spread of our data and you've got a couple of options here uh, the most basic one from a math standpoint will be the range so if you want your students to find the range of your data hit equals and then just remind them that the range is the maximum number close parenthesis, and then minus the minimum number of your data set. And that will give us a range of 6, which you see is correct. Your next option is standard deviation. I really like using this one. Even though, especially in a general classroom, standard deviation is going to be beyond the scope of what most students will be ready to understand from a math background standpoint, I still, even though they can't calculate it, like them to get used to seeing it and get used to understanding what it means when they see a standard deviation that is relatively high or relatively low. So even though we won't discuss how it is calculated, I like to have my students use standard deviation and that one is abbreviated. It's just standard dev. I'll copy and paste that one down. And I also know that some people like to have them discuss quartiles. So we can have it calculate for us the first and third quartile of our data and select and in this one you need to select the range and then hit comma and it will want to know which quartile you want to know and so this one you can see I've labeled first quartile so I'll double click on that and then hit enter and we have our first quartile and then we'll find our third quartile also comma third close parenthesis Enter. We've got it. All right. So now we have our initial setup. We're ready to start making our graph. So we're going to select. We're graphing the mean of our data. And please notice on the zero percent concentration, I put in 300. That is a proxy for infinity because a zero percent hydrogen peroxide solution will never make our floating disk rise. But putting in infinity is difficult. So for our math purposes, 300 is close enough to infinity. And then hold control and click on your concentrations. So we want to graph our mean versus concentration. And then go up to insert. And we want a scatter plot. Top left is always best. And we've got our initial scatter plot here. We need to add a couple of things. I'm going to get some stuff out of the way for us so we can see a little better. First thing we're going to add is our trend line. Now, I like to let the kids play with this a little bit, but you're going to find that exponential is the trend line that fits best, and we do want to see the equation in the R value. And then because 300 was an arbitrary choice, I like to have it zoom in a little bit on our actual data, so we're going to format the axis. And I want to set fixed maximum and minimum values. The zero is fine. I like to do it just above what our highest mean was, which you can see it ended up being 140, so 145 is probably good enough. And so we can see our data just a little bit better there. The next thing we want to add is our error bars. So click on the actual dots here to select the data set. And then on layout, we have error bars. Now you don't want to use any of the preset calculators. We want to do more error bar options. 
and then hit custom. Now, if you noticed, you can see our graph is pretty messed up right now. That's okay. Don't freak out. We'll fix it in just a second. Custom, specify value, and here is where we'll click on this box, and the positive error value is how high do we want it to go up. And we want it to go up by one standard deviation, and then click the box again. Negative value, same thing, down by one standard deviation, and close, and we're all set. Then just click on those horizontal error bars. It automatically inserts those. Just click on them. If they're selected, you'll see little bubbles appear on their edges, and hit the button delete, and our graph is immediately right back to normal. Okay, if you're doing quartiles, rather than having selecting your quartile bars, you need to have it calculate the distance between the first quartile and the mean or the second quartile. And so you're going to have to do an additional formula, and that is going to be hit equals, and we want to do the mean minus the first quartile. And for our third quartile, we need to do third quartile minus mean. So that will find our two distances which is what we really want our error bars to be. So if you're going to do first and third quartile, for positive values, we're going up by the distance from the mean to the third quartile. And negative error value, we're going down by the distance from the mean to the first quartile. Okay, and then you can see our error bars adjust accordingly. Okay, that's the basics to it. From here, you can start to compare this curve to a curve that you make from any other condition. To compare it, you can make predictions. You can see the little x here in this rather intimidating formula. And you can calculate the prediction for any percentage. So if you want to know, according to our data, how quickly a disk that's put in 10% hydrogen peroxide will sink and float back to the top, you just put in 10% for the x value, crunch the algebra, and the y output will be where this line would end up if it went all the way out to 10%. And then you can talk to the students about this r squared value, which is how well our trend line fits the actual data. So right now, 0.89, is that high, is that low? One would be a perfect fit, and zero would be an absolutely, it doesn't fit at all. And from here, you can start to compare the difference between two lines. So you can see, I've set up an example here of some students that may have done a yeast catalase, and these are our original numbers. And then they did the same procedure to, cat to gather data for spinach catalase. And then they want to compare the two sets to see if there's a difference. And so we set up a chart here. We've got two trend lines on the same graph. We've color-coded them, and we can compare the R values. We can compare predictions between the two. We've got all sorts of data analysis options available to us now that we start to compare the two reaction curves. Good luck.